Thank you. A very good afternoon to all the audience online. I'm speaking from Singapore and greetings from the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Uh, Mr. Yasuhiko Yoshida, Vice Chairman of RITI, Mr. Choi Shin Kwok, CEO and Director of ICES, and Mr. Tetsuya Watanabe, Vice President of RITI, to my fellow panelists and, and all our guests. Thank you very much to RITI for the invitation. Uh, we are very happy to be part of the ASEAN Japan Business Week 2022. And I'm also privileged to share Southeast Asian perspectives on the current geopolitical um, developments that's taking place around the world. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see the screen. I will be presenting um, today uh, based on the an annual survey that we have been doing in the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. So very quickly, this is an annual survey that we conduct and the objective of the survey is to gauge the views and perceptions of Southeast Asians towards geopolitical developments affecting the region, as well as key regional affairs and how ASEAN has engaged with its dialogue partners. This is the fourth year that we are doing the survey. We started in 2019. So for this year, um, we polled about 1,677 respondents across 10 countries. The survey was offered in five language options, English, Bahasa, Indonesia, Laos, Khmer, and Vietnamese. What is different this year is that we apply a new weightage methodology of 10% per country. The rationale is that all 10 ASEAN member states um, make equal decisions at the table. Now, the survey was conducted in November and December last year, and the report analysis was completed in February. We launched the report about eight days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So as you can imagine, the world has changed very much since then. And geopolitical considerations are now different. Strategic calculations have also changed. So what I have done is I have curated the key highlights of the survey that are relevant to the changing paradigm as a starting point for our panel discussion later. And I will start um, with the regional outlook and developments. So in one of the questions that we ask every year um, to the respondents are what they see as the top three challenges facing Southeast Asia. And you can see at last year that COVID-19's threat to health uh, was the top choice, followed by unemployment and economic recession and then climate change and the more intense frequent uh, weather events that are being experienced in this region. And it's not surprising that the Philippines and Vietnam gave higher weightages to climate change. Um, and in this question, all countries except for Myanmar chose COVID-19's threat to public health as its top challenge. For Myanmar, its top choice um, was the deterioration of human rights condition. Also, what is interesting here is that um, issues like domestic political stability and terrorism that were important pre-COVID are now overtaken by COVID considerations. In another question that we also poll every year is about the top concerns about ASEAN. And here you can see that ASEAN is deemed as slow and ineffective by over 70% of the respondents. It is a top choice in seven countries. And the second top concern is that it risks becoming an arena of major power competition. And the third concern is the inability to overcome current pandemic challenges. There was a significant jump in concern about ASEAN's own relevance, uh, especially in Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. And again, I just want to reflect that in the past, concerns uh, that ASEAN's benefits are not felt by the people or that ASEAN is being elitist and disconnected have now been overtaken by the sense of ASEAN becoming slow and ineffective. 
And moving on to uh, looking at how major uh, the extent of major powers, regional influence and leadership in the region. We asked the question of what, which country or regional organization is deemed the most influential economic power. And here it is not surprising that China retains the title of being most influential. And this is consistent uh, as a trend that we observe since 2019. And this is followed by the US at 9.8% and then ASEAN at 7.6%. So, the long-term trend really is that China is leading in economic influence, although there are small fluctuations year on year. But there is also a huge gap between China and the US in terms of economic influence. And the highest recognition of levels of China's flu influence is from Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Singapore. Now, China's economic cooperation with ASEAN is extensive with individual FTAs, ASEAN-China FTA, in the RCEP and now with its application to join the CPTPP. Our current as assessment uh, in this climate is that it is too large a gap to fill even with the new Indo-Pacific economic framework. And in this same question, we also ask participants uh, whether they are worried or do they welcome this economic power's influence in their country. So here we see majority remain worried about China with the uh, regional anxieties slightly decreasing overall. But some countries recorded an increase in anxiety towards China and that is Laos, Myanmar and Singapore. On the flip side, when we look at the data, most respondents welcome the influence of ASEAN and the US. Um, here, I would just like to uh, make a point that it is a curious case of actually perceptions not matching up with the data because according to the ASEAN Statistical Yearbook 2020, mm -hmm. the US is actually ASEAN's top investor with 15.2% of total share of FDI, foreign direct investment, in 2019. And uh, that share is recorded at about $24 billion, overtaking Japan, the EU, Hong Kong and China. So you can see that China is actually the fifth largest uh, FDI into um, ASEAN. And the US is also ASEAN's second largest trading partner with total two-way trade at $294 billion in 2019. Now, because the US and ASEAN does not have an FTA, um, trade and investment issues continue to be discussed under the 2006 Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, TIFA, and the Expanded Economic Initiative. So all in all, um, what needs to be done is that if the US really wants a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN, it needs to rethink the TIFA and the Expanded Economic Initiative to see how they can move closer towards ASEAN economically. Another question we ask is which country or regional organization has the most political and strategic influence in Southeast Asia? And here, China is still top at 54.4%, followed by the US at 29.7%, and ASEAN at 11.2%. But the gap between the US and China is much narrower here at about 25 percentage points. And again, we see the strongest views coming from Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. And Philippines is the only country to choose US over China. In the worry and welcome question about the political and strategic influence of this country, um, the region is still worried about China's growing strategic cloud, although it is a decrease. But the greatest acceptance of China's uh, political strategic influence is from Cambodia. And we recorded incre increased apprehension towards China from Myanmar, Singapore, and Laos. In another question on who respondents have uh, in terms of strongest confidence to provide leadership in championing global free trade, um, the ranking in 2022 you see is US, China, ASEAN, EU, and Japan. So the confidence in the US expanded from 19.7% to over 30% this year, and China ranked second place, ASEAN at third place. Um, the EU now placed fourth place and Japan placed fifth place. Um, but in effect, when we look at the actual um, developments happening in this region, the US has not really demonstrated concrete actions to champion free trade. Here again, we do wonder to ourselves the question of whether 
uh, the kind of confidence in the U.S. is really uh, related to the Biden effect. Because for the last four years of the Trump administration, the region has felt quite neglected in terms of uh, having someone to champion free trade. So when um, the Biden administration came in, there was this overflow of confidence. In another question, we asked about upholding rules-based order and international law. Um, here, it's a very surprising reversal. Uh, again, I might say that this might be a, a Biden effect. The US again came up tops, followed by ASEAN and the EU. And the US is the top choice for the following countries, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. ASEAN is top for Brunei, Indonesia, and Laos, whereas China is Cambodia's top choice. Um, here, if you look at the data, it's quite surprising if you look at the orange bar, which is China's um, uh, proportion. China is viewed increasingly as taking leadership in maintaining rules-based order. It increased from 4.4% to 13.6%. In this question, Japan is most trusted by Laos. And moving on, the question on Quad, um, we found that there is um, uh, kind of a greater interest in the Quad. We asked the question about the Quad two years ago, but back then the response towards the Quad was quite ambivalent. Um, and in view of last week's high profile summit that was hosted by Tokyo, it does seem that the Quad has finally turned the corner. Um, the skeptics of in 2020 have, are actually now expressing more positivity because of the change in the narrative of the Quad from a security focus to more tangible cooperation like vaccine security and climate change. Um, so you see here in, in the camp of people who strongly agree or agree, 58.5% uh, think that it is constructive for the region, especially for the Philippines, Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore and Myanmar. Um, the 13.1% um, that disagreed with this question, actually um, a very strong disagreement came from Cambodia. And in another question which we asked on the AUKUS, uh, we inserted this question on the AUKUS uh, two weeks before we were due to launch the survey because the news about AUKUS came out um, quite late in October. So now on the AUKUS, um, 30, you can see there's an almost an equal split. About 36.4% feel that it will help balance China's growing military power, especially so for Myanmar and the Philippines. About a quarter say it will escalate an arms race. Another fifth say that it will undermine the nuclear weapons non-proliferation regime. And another fifth feel that it will weaken ASEAN centrality. For the AUKUS, because it is highly security focused, I think um, our current assessment is that it is harder for respondents to support the AUKUS versus the Quad because of this security angle. But we shall see how the AUKUS eventually uh, moves forward in the region. Another question that we often ask um, our respondents is, when, how should ASEAN best respond to the crossfire between Beijing and Washington? And here, ASEAN continues to favour a proactive approach of enhancing its own resilience and unity to fend off pressure. And this outstrips the traditional preference of not choosing sides. Um, but the option to seek out third parties to broaden strategic space and, op and uh, options has actually increased to 16.2%. Uh, we also gave a binary question. They were forced, uh, if ASEAN were forced to align itself with either the US or China, which one would it choose? Um, here you can see there's um, actually a 0.8% increase for the US at 57%. So the greatest support for the US is from Myanmar, Philippines, and Singapore, whereas the greatest support for China is from Cambodia, Laos, and Brunei. And in another uh, question that we ask about seeking out third parties to hedge against the uncertainties of the US-China strategic rivalry, who is the most preferred and trusted partner for ASEAN, the front runners remain EU and Japan. Um, the share for Japan and India actually decreased, whereas the share for Australia, UK and ROK increased. 
And there was a significant increase for the UK particularly, um, as the UK joined ASEAN as its 11th dialogue partner last year. Um, in this section where we evaluated trust uh, of the dialogue partners, we pulled the respondents on five countries, which is US, China, EU, Japan, and India. Yeah, so in this question, uh, Japan remains as the most trusted major power. Um, it is recognized as a responsible stakeholder with vast economic resources and political will. Um, its share trust actually decreased from 68.2% to 54.2%. And in second place is the US, uh, which under the Biden administration actually jumped and increased from 47% to 52.8%. And in third place, the EU's ranking uh, has also declined from 49.7 to 48.5%. But although there was a decline in Japan's trust ratings, it still remained the most trusted, especially in Philippines, Vietnam, and Myanmar. What was surprising for us is to see the large swing in trust in Cambodia. So Cambodia's trust levels actually dropped significantly um, from 84.6% to 32.1%. In terms of distrust, um, so despite the concerns of economic and military clout, China's distrust ratings dec declined slightly from 59.6% to 58.1%. Um, the distrust towards India also dropped from 52% to 47.8%. Um, and the US's uh, distrust ratings actually decreased also from 31.1% to 29.6%. What I would like to uh, point out here in, in this picture is that um, we should not uh, place too much emphasis on the year-on-year -year fluctuations. For, for us, when we look at the data over four years, um, the fact remains that Japan uh, is still the most trusted partner. It's just that during the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021, the image of Japan uh, really was very strong as in it was a fortress Japan image. Japan was relatively invisible or silent on the world stage. We didn't really see much diplomatic action coming out of Japan and a lot of it uh, was due to the pandemic. So for instance, Prime Minister Suga made a visit to the region in 2020, but that could not be maintained. Uh, in, in its momentum, largely due to pandemic and also due to the domestic um, uh, elections within Japan. But now with uh, Prime Minister Kishida taking the lead, we now see that um, there is greater activity coming out of Japan, including his visits to Jakarta, Hanoi and Bangkok, which were all very well received. And in fact, in the immediate aftermath of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, the region saw active diplomacy from Tokyo in the form of phone calls to its partners. Um, I believe there was a quad uh, phone call in March to talk about Ukraine. And also we saw PM Kishida visiting Phnom Penh um, sometime in March that may have resulted in a shift in the Cambodian position towards uh, Russia and Ukraine. And finally, on soft power, um, Japan remains unparalleled uh, in terms of you know, soft power, you consistently most preferred country to visit. Um, and that speaks a lot in itself. I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I just want to touch a little on the current developments. So as we can see, the world has actually um, really been bettered in the last two and a half to three years. First with COVID, then we saw the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan. Also within this region, Myanmar, there's a crisis and it's proving to be the most severe test of ASEAN unity and centrality uh, when the coup took place last year in February 2021. And also this year, the most uh, breaking event was um, the invasion of Ukraine. But uh, on the flip side, we also see movements in terms of the US um, uh, ASEAN summit that took place quite recently, two weeks ago, and then the Quad met in Tokyo. There's also been some activity in terms of anti-ballistic missile firing from the North Korean peninsula. 
um, China is not sitting back and watching. There's been a security cooperation agreement made with the Solomon Island. And here we see the last uh, picture with Prime Minister Kishida making his rounds uh, in the region. So all in all, um, just to, to, to make a point that um, the, the challenges that we're facing are tremendous and they are rapidly um, changing daily. Um, and that makes for a very challenging time for states uh, as they make their uh, consideration. And I just also wanted to make a point that in all of this flood, um, we see Japan as quite a, a factor for stability. Um, in the question that we asked about Japan, uh, how confident are you that Japan will do the right thing to contribute to global peace and security, prosperity and governance? You can see very strong ratings um, for Japan overall. And when we ask why do they trust Japan um, the biggest reason given is that you're a responsible stakeholder that respects and champions international law. And this certainly came through in the Ukraine crisis. And the second biggest reason is that your economic resources and political will um, can provide for global leadership. And on the flip side, when we ask why do you distrust Japan, very interestingly, um, Japan's um, lacking political will and capacity for Leadership is a top factor, and this is followed by distractions in the Northeast Asia um, with your neighbors, China, Korea, and, and Taiwan, and therefore that you cannot focus on concerns. But I think um, the, the trust factor for Japan really outweighs the distrust factors. So in closing, some final notes. Um, we are facing a lot of transitions and transformations right now. The kind of challenges that the world is facing compared to even 20 or 30 years ago is very uh, vastly different and very complex at different levels, um, including global, regional and technological forces at play. And some of the problems that we are facing are really wicked problems, including climate change um, and the food scarcity issue that um, we have been with uh, in recent um, days and weeks and threatens to also worsen. Um, so what needs to be done is, I suppose, uh, a protection of the global rules-based order. There has been certain changes to the status quo, including in Ukraine, and that's something that, um, you know, majority of the world cannot accept because we have been living in, in this international global order that has been shaped after World War II, and a sudden change to it, it really brings shocks through the whole entire system. And the last point to make is that, you know, Japan being seen as a supporter of rule of law and multilateralism certainly has a role to play, particularly in, in the Asia Pacific region. And we see that um, Japan is, is really um, putting its foot forward and trying to play that role. So with that, I will end my presentation and I look forward to um, discussing this further with the panel.